Hey, what do all wealthy people have in common? It's real estate. Real estate investing, okay? And so we're going to do a deep dive in this show with a real estate investor named Corey McKinnon. He's got some great stories about he was able to buy his first home, a sixplex, not like a oneplex, but a sixplex. And he was able to retire from real estate at the age of 36, all right? So Corey McKinnon, he's going to tell great stories and teach you about real estate. Let's jump into the show. Corey, welcome to the show. This is going to be a lot of fun. It will be, man. Looking forward to it. All right. So, you know, we go back in time. We're going to talk about how you became a real estate investor. But, you know, you obviously didn't come out of college or university or uh, your athlete athletic career and just become a millionaire real estate investor. So what was the story? How did you go from athlete job to someone who was able to invest in houses and, and do all the cool stuff that you're doing today? Well, I know we got limited amount of time here, so I'll give you the elevator version of it. But um, you know, I guess I started uh, my, my sport that I would trained at for a long time, at, starting at the age of 13, all the way up until about the age of 28. You I started Olympic sport. lifting at 13? Yeah, man. I mean, even before that, like I remember being in grade eight. So in grade eight, I think it was 12. And there was, you know, a handful of us would just monkey around in my friend's basement, right, with the old weights that were filled up with cement and seeing how much we could lift overhead and probably definitely doing, you know, improper technique. Sure. Um, but so, yeah, it was actually the summer between grade eight and grade nine. I got a, a summer job working on a farm and they'd always bust us out uh, to these cornfields and pull the tassels out of the corn. Oh, yeah. So there was a kid on the bus that was actually you know, in this, you know, formalized system of, of lifting is probably about 16 or 17. And, um, you know, really, like, I think when people say that, you know, starting to lift, like, yeah, you can't lift heavy, heavy, heavy when you're young, and you're, maybe your bones haven't fully developed or your growth plates or whatever. Um, but I mean, I think it takes quite some time for you to develop that maximal load or that that maximum force, you know, you just your nervous system's not ready, you don't know what a full out all of effort is, right? until you're much older anyway so oh yeah. so you got into that and you were doing that for 15 years at a very high level yeah so within three years i was uh, national level you know uh, back then it wasn't that hard to get provincial level but um you know not not everybody got to the national level and made my first junior nationals when i was 17 and um you know i guess my peak peak highlight of my athletic career was yeah going to some of these big events like Olympic trials, Commonwealth trials, uh, place top three for the senior category. Um, you know, I was in one of the most competitive weight classes and um, also medaled lots of times when I was under 20. I guess I maybe I peaked. I was an early developer, but I uh, got all kinds of junior junior national medals and I've only got one senior national medal. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's that's a clear path to real estate investing. So so how did you get the bug on that? Sure. So I guess when I was younger, actually one of the one of the my friends that we would we'd mess around with the weights when we were younger, his dad was a realtor. So I remember, you know, that's back when you could actually go see listings in the newspaper and all that sort of stuff. And I remember, you know, just calling up a realtor. I didn't want to bother my my dad's uh, my friend's dad about it, but I remember just calling a realtor when I was young, like 16. I just said, like, hey, I want to get through this triplex or whatever. You know, I, I guess my dad dabbled a little bit in real estate too. So we actually grew up in a duplex as well when I was younger. So I got exposed to it at a young age. And, uh, but my dad never really took it all that far, right? He had one property, maybe two and bought high, sold low, just never really, you know, was trying to maybe time the market yeah. a little bit and just wasn't in the market long enough. But it was kind of cool that you got exposed to this at a young age. And um, I guess my first full exposure was when I started working in my corporate job um, second year of college, I started running a franchise for a company called Student Works Painting and uh, College Pro Painting. I mean, very similar. It's all across yeah. North America. Did really well with that. And my boss there was actually house hacking. Like he had a duplex. He was living on the main floor, renting out some rooms. And then he also rented his basement too. Got it. I just said, man, if my boss can do it, I, I can do this too. And, uh, you know, didn't actually end up getting my first property till I was 30. But um, once once I picked up the first one, man, it was game on. And uh, within six years, I was retired. Just, you know, pure, pure side hustle. It's one of those things where you're you're buying assets that are going to serve you really well into the future. I still have the majority of my holdings. So I'm not like a big buy and sell kind of guy. I do the odd mm -hmm. flip and whatnot. But largely, I'm buying stuff that I want to hold on to for the next 10, 20 years. 
And what was your evolution in buying places? Was it, all, was it starting off as single family or duplex? And did you get into fourplexes or multifamily, that sort of stuff? Yeah, my first, my first property I ever bought, I was actually renting in the sixplex. And I've told this story a few times, but, you know, I, me and my, the owner of the building, um, since I had the painting background, right, sometimes I did favors and I would help paint a unit for him or help him out be his boots on the ground. And he'd always throw out these numbers like, hey, do you want to buy the sixplex? The price is whatever, 350000 uh, Then it went up to 400000 Then one day, one of my staff messaged me. I think this was maybe before text messaging or right around the time the text messaging started working on phones. But they're like, there's a for sale sign on, on the lawn of the place that you're renting. And I thought you had a deal with the owner that you're going to maybe going to buy the sixplex. So we, had, we eventually ended up figuring that out. And I ended up buying my first property was actually a six unit apartment building. And then from there, you know, once you do something harder in the beginning, it's like running a marathon is your first running race. And if you want to do a 5K or a 10K, it's much easier. Yeah. And uh, yeah, from there, I've just been picking up really good quality buildings. In the past three years, I've started to do bigger deals. Like we're doing apartment buildings and uh, like conversions. We bought a big, big old church that we're going to be, you know, cutting up into 29 units, developing raw land all those different things too. So it's, it's getting exciting, right? You know, you obviously should start smaller, but it, you know, the difference between doing a big deal and a small deal, it's a lot of, it's just mindset. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not drastically, drastically, you know, I think we just make up in our heads like, Oh my gosh, it's so much bigger and it's going to be so much harder, but it's really not. How did you come up with the money for the six bullets? I, I, <laughs> I just figured it away. I mean, I, um, you know, up here in Canada, we can do a portion of our, our TF, uh, not our TFSA, our RSPs as first time home buyers. Yeah. And then, uh, cause back then you needed like a 25% down payment if you didn't want to pay any of these extra government fees and whatnot. Uh, so I actually got an advance on my commissions that year. I was able to negotiate an advance on my commissions, you know, two, three months early. So that I actually had a big, big windfall that I could go and invest in it. So just ended up piecing it together. Got a little bit of a credit on closing from the owner. So you know, when there's, when there's a big enough, why you'll, you'll, you'll figure out how to, how to do it. If you really I want love, to do it. I right? love it. I love it. So just pure, so much negotiation in, in that deal. Do you find there's a, a lot of negotiation and is that something that you spend a lot of time on in your business? Well, I think when you're a real estate investor, you need to, it's interesting because I'm actually going to be starting up a podcast myself and the, the, the name that I'm toying with is action taker, deal maker. Like and, it. you know, you either got to get really good at negotiating the deal. And we're not talking about like hammering people down, like at a Mexican market where you're trying to negotiate the price of a, a doodad or a thing. I mean, it's actually about how creative you can be and figure out a way that works for you and the seller. And sometimes even the realtors get creative as well and make the deal work too. Um, because, you know, price is not always the most important piece of the puzzle, right? It is important but it's, it's not always number one. And that's something I really want to drill into the heads of the people that I work with too, that, you know, don't be pulling so hard on the price lever, like, you know, keep the price the same and then figure out a way to work all the other levers on a deal, whether it's, you know, the term or some of the conditions, or maybe it's empty units. If you have some tenants paying really low rent, there's all kinds of other levers you can pull on that might not be very important to the buyer. And he'll say, sure, I'll give you that. It's kind of like you're negotiating cards, right? You only have so many cards to pull. Or to play and uh, if you try to really just pull on that price card you might not always have the best luck what you're looking for what's one of your most creative deals where you know aside from the six bucks which is probably one of them what's another one that that makes for a good story yeah i guess one of my recent deals you know so we just closed on another apartment building and uh, this was right at the peak of covid so I remember it's like when all this stuff was hitting, you know, we're both Canadian. I was, up, I was actually traveling down to the States. So I was down in South Carolina. We're really fit people, even though I don't lift a lot anymore. I do it more for fun. Still the summertime is when we are biking and running. So we go down to South Carolina actually to go bike up mountains. That's our version of fun and bring all the kids down there too. So um, this deal came across my plate. We're literally negotiating at the beginning of COVID. And I'm, you know, we both weren't really sure where the market was going. So uh, we were trying to stretch out the conditionary period and the negotiation period and just crazy stuff was happening. I mean, somebody passed away in one of the units and we want to make sure we're doing the right thing there and making sure that the family had time to you know, take care of um, their son's possessions and whatnot and being as careful, uh, mindful as possible of that situation. So what we ended up doing was, and the seller wanted this anyways, they wanted a really long closing because 
for anybody that knows real estate terms here, they were actually had a huge hard money loan on the apartment building. So they didn't have your typical, um, they had a mortgage, but they also topped that mortgage up with like, not really a loan shark, but we call it hard money. So it's, it's a more expensive loan. They prepaid for that insurance, for that interest for the entire year. So they're like, hey, well, let's do a let's do a closing date 12 months from now. And in turn for doing that, I was able to manage the property, stabilize it, increase the rents. You know, I could put as much money as I wanted to in the property before I owned it. And, you know, they wanted a really large deposit. So they got what they were looking for, which was a large deposit. I got the ability to extend, you know, the closing later and really improve that building to the point where when we closed on it, it had gone up in value by $200,000. And, you know, if your lender is giving you 80% loan to value, essentially we didn't have to put anything into that deal because the appraisal came out at, at a million. We bought it for 800,000, 80% loan to value. We just had to come up with some legals and closing costs. So that was a, a creative deal. I wouldn't recommend doing that as your first deal. But <laughs> I've been doing this for 15 years. So this was something that uh, we were able to handle no problem. That's amazing. Now, you mentioned, you know, that you do a lot of stuff with your family and your kids and, and you're very active. So I'm actually going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about what are the success routines and habits that you've had to have in place in order to, you know, before you're able to retire, you know, have a full time job, um, have a happy marriage and raise kids and do the real estate on the side. What worked for you then and how have things changed over the couple of years? Um, since you've been able to retire, uh, as you have this new daily routine. Yeah. You know, everybody goes through different stages in their life. Right. So I remember being a bachelor and I'm sure you can too, where there was really only one time of the day. It was like, you know, sun's up, it's time to work. So right. it's just from the time I woke up to the time I went to, went to bed, we we're just out there hustling and grinding. Then you get into a serious relationship that changes because they obviously need some attention. Then you get married and that changes because now you have other commitments with not just your family, but their family too. Then you have your first child, it changes again. Um, you know, second child, third child. So right now we have four and uh, we got the baby princess here at the end. So that's awesome. So I guess, you know, you really have to delegate and offload the things that, you know, aren't your unique talent. It really is uh, a great way to put you under pressure and, you know, no pressure, no diamonds, and just realize like, hey, it's not the best use of my time to do this or to make that phone call or to do this thing or to be the boots on the ground over there. So I think it's actually great. You know, I've, I have a lot of respect for parents that are running businesses or buying real estate or whatever it might be doing big things because they are super focused on what is the most important tax, task, what is their unique talent and spending the majority of their time there. Um, because it's either it's either the business does well and your family does well. You don't want to trade either or, right? right. So you want to make sure that that both do well. A lot of people say, "Hey, Corey, I don't know how you do it." And it's like, well, you have admins and you have assistants and you have great help on your team, and you know you're just in the uh, you know the radio control tower, <laughs> you know, making sure everything is going well, right? And being more of a leader. So it definitely tests your leadership skills. I agree with you on the fact that having kids can make someone a better entrepreneur or a better real estate investor or better whatever it is that they are because it really should help you cut the fluff more than ever because a lot of us um, a, a lot of people think they are time poor but they're actually more decision poor and if you actually looked at somebody's daily routine you'd find a lot of uh, with outside eyes we would all find a lot of extra time in somebody's day, just like someone could probably come and find some extra time, even in my day. And having kids is the ultimate in boundaries and parameters and, and hard stops that, that make you make harder decisions. So I appreciate that. And then how do you communicate with your wife for, for success in, in all areas, you know, in terms of having time to do this podcast? I think it's 930 where you are right now in the evening or, um, you know, being able to get your training in or be able to, you know, for her to get her training in and for, you know, obviously there's then going to be the, the parade of getting kids to school. What's the communication rhythm that you found has worked? Yeah, so my wife is a big morning person. And, um, you know, so it's, it's a, it's like a non negotiable that she doesn't get her workout in the morning. So she's up 6am 630. She's getting her workout in. 
I'm uh, I'm more like stay up late at night. I could I could work out at ten o'clock at night. I mean that's wow. my my clock is just on a different uh, di- on a different cycle. I usually don't, but I mean it could, and I'm still you know that that blows off the steam and I can go to sleep. Um, so making sure that she gets what she needs in the morning. We want to have a good takeoff to the day. So and I'm big on making sure my kids are eating healthy food. So I'm in there right in the trenches in the morning, making them food and breakfast, and that's my chance to bond with them in the morning. So I usually spend time with them in the morning and then make sure we have a good uh, uh, landing in the evening and get them down to bed. So we definitely strategically planned this podcast. I'm like, okay, when can I book in Craig's schedule? (laughs) The the kids will be down even if we're on vacation. So we're actually in a fantastic Airbnb right now. Um, Lots of windows here and stuff like that. And it's just a great, great property. Awesome. Uh, so that's that's what I like to do. And then obviously me and my wife, like we got to book time together. Usually it's on Mondays, like once the kids are off to school or they're into their first thing between like 10 and 11. I'm like, we got to have, you know, some family meeting time here. What's going on? What's happening next? Um, every day we kind of have a schedule for what's happening in the family. And we also make where, sure- Where do you those- keep that? Do you keep that up on a wall? Is it on an iPad? Everybody's phones? Yeah, we, I've tried the phone thing and just trying to get everything to sync doesn't always work. So we're just kind of old school. We um, we got, I'm sure people have heard of whiteboard paint or, or chalkboard paint. Yeah. Um, you can actually get clear coat paint too. It's like, um, who makes it? I forget what it's called, but it's by Sherwin Williams. And it literally, you can just put it on any color wall and it makes the wall shiny. And uh, we just write on it with the dry erase markers too. So uh, scratch board, scratch board or sketch board or something like that. Uh-huh. So we just write it down low. Like I, I view level for the kids so even they can see it. And, you know, that's just what we do every day. And we, all, we also have backups in our phones for all the major repeating stuff like soccer and Taekwondo. We want to make sure our kids are in events, right? And that way I can make it to as many events as possible. But it's, um, it's busy, man. I mean, my, my wife is great. She is the manager of the house. She's the manager of the kids. And I think just anything, making sure that she's getting what she needs to make sure that she's not just a mom. She's also an athlete. She's also a professional. I mean, she's a teacher. She's a gym teacher. Wow. And, uh, you know, making sure that everybody's getting it, what they want out of the relationship. So it's not like, just like having a dog. I always say it's like having 10 dogs. Yeah. Uh, how old are your kids? Um, so right now I'm 40, we're both 45. And then my, my kids are nine, seven, soon to be four, soon to be two. So at least okay. everybody's sleeping through the night, which is great. Yeah. Um, Cause it can get kind of messy when your kids are young and, you're just lucky to get up and, and get sleep, but you know, you, you get, you just learn to get by on less. I mean, you know, you don't need to have eight to 10 hours sleep every single night. Um, I think actually if people need to sleep 10 hours a night, there's usually some kind of health issue. Like they're probably oh, yeah, totally. Crazy. I was like, who sleeps 10 hours a night? <laughs> I, I don't know, man, but uh, you know, I, I can get by on, I guess with my, uh, all my data that I track on my watch, it's like six and a half to, to almost seven hours a night. That's, yeah. that's what I need. So what do you, what do you think you um, what do your kids think that you do you know you uh, you're in your office you're you're making videos sometimes you're yelling into a computer what do they think that uh, dad does well you know it's always interesting when your kids are like daddy we we typed your name into YouTube and stuff came up like you're on people's you know YouTube videos and whatnot oh, that's funny. so. Um, well, you'll be on this one. Here's another one. That we'll find. That's right. That's right. So they, they know that daddy, mommy and daddy own a lot of apartment buildings. And um, it's just interesting. I mean, they don't really do a great job in school at all teaching kids or really adults about money in general anyway. So really just trying to teach them that like, hey, daddy runs businesses that help serve other people. Mm-hmm. And um, they know that we rent lots of things because we have regular apartments. We have furnished apartments like we have 13 furnished apartments. And I remember one time there was like some furniture in the garage um, that we used from a de-staging or whatever. And they're like, hey, that's a really big mirror. Are you going to rent that mirror? And, uh-huh. uh, you know, just exposing them to a young age that, you know, there's, there is, you know, jobs and opportunities outside of your regular J-O-B type things or, you know, go get a job. You know, everybody's in Canada. It's like, if you got a government job, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the pinnacle of everything. Yeah. Until you realize that it just doesn't go. I mean, I look at my wife's paycheck and it's, you know, she works, she's a teacher and I just see all the deductions that come off there. I'm like we just buy a, a fourplex or a fiveplex in cash. That's really, that'll fund our retirement just as much as, you know, your, your pension will. So, yeah. but she really loves her job. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to be a healthy person where you can just literally walk 600 meters to work and wear your running shoes to work. And it's six hours a day 
and still be able yeah. to make things work. So that's fascinating. So if we go back to um, actually, let me ask you one more question about your kids. But of the oldest three, which one is the uh, is the business entrepreneur? I is there one my, of them where it stands out? Yeah, like my my oldest is uh, more academic, so he gets the numbers and you know, he, I think he understands a little bit more, but then even my seven-year-old, I think he, he understands, he understands like the you know, lingo and, and the hard cash and like what, you know, maybe the lifestyle, <laughs> he's all about <laughs> chilling, right? I'm like, you know, how do you, it's like, he's, uh, we're walking by cars and he's, he's like, that's an Audi, isn't it? Is it an Audi R8? I'm like, how do you know these different things, right? And I think it's just through video games or yeah. whatever, but, you know, I, I think he's, he's got the more connection of what, you know, business could do to you as far as, you know, the, the enjoyment aspect of it. And, uh, but he's like my worker bee, he's going to be getting dirty on job sites and whatever. And my other, so we always joke that my oldest son is going to be the one that's kind of managing the books yeah. and maybe doing the deals and putting things together. He's a little more social. And then my other son will help to build it and take care of it. And then, uh, you know, the third, the third and fourth, we're not too sure yet, but that's, I'm sure they'll be involved. That's funny. Okay. So let's go back to something very important that you said that nobody's really taught how to take care of their money in school. So when it comes to real estate investing, because we can make a laundry list of things that people do wrong with their money, but when it comes to real estate investing, where do people go wrong aside from taking too long to get in the game? Yeah, I mean, feeling like they need to have all their own money. And that was even my mindset in the beginning was that I had to have all my own money. It was all me to go get that big down payment you know, for someone that was new to buying a property back in 2005, I had to come up with $107,000 to close on that property. So that was a big nut to cover for sure. And just that you need to, you need all your own money. You don't, there's so much money in the world. Like look how much money has been printed this year. Yeah. I think I heard a stat that 40% of all money was never even here a year ago, right? It's just new money floating around in the system. So there's a lot of money out there. If you know how to attract it your way, you know, you can, you could do like a, a, a short-term mortgage or a second mortgage to go pay that down payment back. So, you know, right now it's kind of cool. I coach people in their early twenties to go close on real estate and they don't have all the cash to close on it, but they have a really good deal. So when you have a really good deal, it's not like the money will magnetically just come flying at you, but the chances of attracting that money into your network, if you can present it properly and in a, in a, in a tasteful way to other people that you have an opportunity for them to invest in, um, it's, you know, it's not for everybody. You always got to be the, uh, the, the, the flame and not the, uh, not the moth, right? You want to mm -hmm. be having things coming your way. So I guess that's probably the biggest thing is just, you know, you don't need all the money to actually, you know, have a property of your own. And maybe on the flip side is that sometimes homeownership is overrated. You know, you're paying a lot in taxes, a lot in maintenance. I mean, I look at, you know, we're, we're in a nice neighborhood. We have one of the most premium lots, big lot. And so we could have a swimming pool and all that sort of stuff. But I'm like, man, we're kissing away eight or 900 bucks a month just in property tax, right? So, you know, there's also something to be said that, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, um, so one smart thing that, you you know, young people could be doing with their money is to start a business because then when you have a two-bedroom apartment, you know, or a high-end condo, you can be writing off a good portion of that against your taxes. So, you know, there's, there's pros and cons. I've seen people do very well either way. You won't be, you know, building up an asset for yourself. And really your home isn't your asset anyways. Um, your home is where you hang your hat. You know, when you have an apartment building, not just a single family home or a duplex, like when you start to get into bigger buildings, that's when those things are real true assets. They'll weather pretty much any storm. They'll always be, you know, the highest asset class, you know, when, um, when it comes to lending or mortgaging or if the world goes, you know, to heck in a handbasket. People you know, got to live somewhere, right? That's right. That's right. So what are, what are some of your parameters for real estate investing deals, whether it's these are my parameters for a single house or a duplex or a fourplex? Like, are there any kind of Corey rigid rules that you follow? For sure. Well, yeah, let's start small and then we'll go bigger. Um, when it comes to single family homes, it is getting harder and harder to make those work, you know, as far as, you know, cash flow, right? So cash flow is what's left over after all the expenses are paid every single month. Um, you know, what a lot of people are pivoting to now that it's obviously more popular and what I'm staying in, what you've stayed in a lot is Airbnbs. So you could get a really good single family home, run the numbers. Will it make sense on Airbnb? You know, spend the money on furniture, 
and that's one of the only plays that can still work at least up in Canada like you know home the average home cost of a home in Canada is much higher than it is in the United States so that's why I'm not really super active buying single family homes if I still have single family homes in my portfolio we're going to see if does it check the box that would make a good furnished rental is it in a good neighborhood is it you know would someone want to stay there for you know one two three months um, if we get a long-term booking um, when it comes to a duplex duplexes are usually more even mortgage helpers these days so people would get into a duplex if they can't uh, quite afford a regular home on their own at least as a duplex it's going to be a mortgage helper and if it's done really well, if you get a great purchase price and a great location, you know that mortgage helper could all of a sudden turn into maybe a break-even point, maybe a little bit of cash flow. When it gets into bigger buildings, you know usually it's four units and under is residential, considered residential. Above four units is considered commercial. So when you start getting into the bigger buildings, Craig, that's when they don't just look at the comps, like you know what did the other duplex or single-family home sell for. Well, that's what we're going to base your appraisal on. You know, as you get into bigger buildings, they're more like, okay, well, let's look at this as a business and how much, you know, income does this generate every single month and how low are the expenses? And that's how you can really tighten up things. And that's how you increase the value of a property. So usually on bigger buildings, we're looking for something that we can get that lift, right? So is it a little bit under rented right now? Is it a little bit uglier? Some investors call it, is, does the building have a little bit of hair on it? Um, you know, that we can shave off and, and make, uh, make a better proposition to the bank. So, because when you increase the rents and you decrease the expenses every single month, that property becomes more and more valuable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what we're typically looking for. We're looking for properties where we can actually get that lift, turn it around in six to 12 months, and then pull out our initial investment so that we're, um, we're always recycling our money and we don't have that risk or that exposure where it's like, oh man, we have hundreds of thousands of dollars into every single property. You know, we actually wanna make sure our exposure is as small as possible so we can either buy more properties or use that money for things that we wanna use it for. Nice. When it comes to real estate investing, who's your best friend? Like what connections are really valuable for people to have even if they don't have them now, like who should they try and go and, and get a friend, be that. friendly with? I love that question. So, you know, it's very important to have really good lending contacts, uh, really good lending contacts. You know, there's going to be like your white collar circle of like lenders, lawyers, um, realtors that, uh, you know, I, I, I like working with realtors. Some people are like, oh, I can do all this stuff myself. And yes, there are th some things you can do as a real estate investor on your own. However, you know, a realtor that is really good at what they do is always worth their, their commissions that they earn. So that's going to be your white circle team, specifically the lenders, you know, in this environment where it's like last year, I mean, the sky was falling and everybody was like, okay, well, I got, I got equity in my house. I'm going to go pull that out. So what ended up happening was the, all the lending pools and all the lending circles end up getting over overloaded and bogged down just like the price of lumber you know so now it's like lenders were the rock stars of the industry and you know making sure you had really good connections with not just one lender but you know what does any sports team have right they have a really deep bench so you need to have access to lots of extra lenders and then if you're more active if you're a, a real estate investor that's doing a lot more flipping and renovations it's it's going to be your contracting team like you need to make sure that you're the contractors that you work with are loyal and dependable and, you know, they show up and they can actually get a project done on time, which is easier said than done. <laughs> I mean, harder, harder than ever these days. That's right. You know, because now all of a sudden a contractor who's got a truck and has some ability and some skill is like a rock star too. And it's like, you know, not that they are not important. However, it's like, you know, they didn't go to university for what they do or they're not highly regulated. And um, they're not dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars here. You know, they're a contractor that, that learns some skills. So relationships are super key. And so I'd say contractors and lenders. Got it. Now you coach people to kind of get into their kind of third, fourth, fifth deal. Is that right? Yeah. Like we will work with beginners if they are super ambitious, they just got like so much energy and drive and they've shown success and, you know, past life. Um, whether it's in business or in sports or whatever it might be. Um, but typically, yeah, we work with people that are more like intermediate and wanting to go to advanced. So they've done their third or fourth or fifth property, and then they hit a wall. They don't know how to get past that wall. 
they've done as much as they can themselves or by watching YouTube. And uh, that's when, you know, you, you usually have three choices in life, right? You can, you can do nothing, you can do it by yourself, or you can link arms with other people and go further faster. So that's typically how we help people out because we've been there before we've helped, you know, I've helped, you know, I've gone through the trenches and scaled my portfolio and I want to make sure that I can give that gift back to the world. That's really my mission in life is, you know, if I bought another multiplex, it changes my life a little bit, but if I can teach somebody else how to fish and uh, not just give them a fish, not just give them a fishing rod, but teach them how to fish for life. I mean, that's a, that's a huge difference. And that that's super, super gratifying to me. And that's really my mission is, you know, we want to make sure that we can keep growing our portfolio and what we're doing, but our mission is to make sure that we create as many millionaires for real estate as possible too. That's amazing. Now, when you were just starting out, it sounded like you had way more boots on the ground, more, way more real life experience, uh, way more connections than most people. Like, you know, some guy who's, or some woman who sits behind a computer, maybe in technology all day and, and doesn't know anything about real estate aside from rich dad, poor dad. What, what books or courses or events would you say are really helpful to that uh, before I bought my first investment property type investor? Um, you know, I think it's important that they do fill up their, you know, everybody should be mind feeding with great content of whatever industry that they're in, right? Yeah. So. Um, you can't go that go wrong with rich dad, poor dad. I actually know who uh, Kiyosaki's real rich dad was. Um, a lot of people say it's Keith Cunningham. Um, so if anybody knows who Keith is, he's got a great book out there. Yeah. Wow. Um, it was it was Keith's car washes that he was selling his books at and stuff. And you know, it's it's kind of a fable, right? So it's yeah. you know, he never if you ever actually try to ask him and say who was it, you know, it's like it's like oh, it's you know, it's rich dad, and and this is what he taught me and and whatnot. So. I'm, cur I'm currently reading a couple of Keith's books. Um, gosh, yeah, what the heck? Road Less the, Stupid, maybe. And yeah, The Road Less Stupid I'm reading right now, and then The Ultimate Business Blueprint uh, as well. Yeah, Keith's a sharp guy. I've been in the room with him a bunch, and um, I, I just like, you know, he's he's been there. He's, he's, you know, lost it all and gained it all back and, yeah, you know, wants to, you know, teach people how to avoid those pitfalls for sure. So, um, so, so Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, anything written by... Um, uh, Gary Keller. So uh, yeah. he's got a series out there. Obviously, he's the person behind Keller Williams and um, very good, uh, super easy to read. I just I just love the voice and the style. Um, there's a lot of great content out there from bigger pockets. And, you know, it, at the end of the day, though, people just need to know enough that real estate is a great, uh, you know, asset class to invest in. And there's so many people, though, that because there's so many different strategies with real estate, there's so many different markets, there's so many different things, so many different spinoff businesses that a lot of people get paralysis analysis. So I want to make sure if there's one thing that people take away from this is that, yes, read a couple books, you know, make sure that you have the stomach for this, uh, make sure that you can build the right team and then just get started, like start real estate really is the contact sport. So it's not necessarily a knowledge sport. It is a contact sport. So start getting out there and making contacts with the right people that can help get you further down the road. Get yourself out to some meetup groups. Pretty much every major city would have a real estate meetup group. You know, during COVID, it was all virtual, but you know, a lot of them are still going on. I'm actually an ambassador for one of the biggest ones in Ontario right now, and we're still making sure that people are still getting the knowledge and connecting, and you know, having breakout rooms that they could get to know each other in. Oh, and that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Um, in addition to that, you know, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, uh, Corey, was with that mindset, you know, you, you got to have a stomach for it. Um, maybe when you were younger, you had some doubters in, in your life who were like, well, you're really buying that or you really think that you can pull this off. How, how did your mindset deal with those folks? It even was happening in my own house with my parents. So, yeah, you know, because my dad, you know, sort of dabbled and never really saw the, the true benefits of real estate. I mean, you got, you know, just left dirty units by tenants and yeah. you know damage and this and that but that's when you know the leases were done on a handshake and it just there was no there was no you know how to do uh, real estate investing for dummies types book there was no risk debt for debt there's no youtube there's no internet um you know i don't even know back in the in the 80s or 70s how you get the information how to do this sort of thing um so for me i've i've known from a young age that i was always walking a different path you know i was, I was doing sports and that were different I was interested in different things in school. 
And I just make up that I was called to be a leader at a young age. And I took that call. And, um, you know, I, I had a business at a young age too. I had a paper route. So even though it doesn't sound like much now, um, back then you had to actually knock on doors and collect the cash and you got bonuses for growing your route and all that kind of stuff. And I was always doing, didn't just have one part-time job. I had many different part-time jobs in, in the summer months and even during school. So, um, but, you know, don't never take advice from someone who's never been where you want to be. So if you have some of your, your peer, like some of your peers that have never been there, I mean, just always take their, you know, their words as loving guidance and, you know, just file it away as like, okay, I'm not going to take that advice to heart. But, you know, when you see people that you look up, look up to, and you're like, I want to be more like that person, if that person can do it, then I want to do it too. Yeah. And um, like, a, you know, it's not about, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do this sort of thing or a brain surgeon. You just have to be. Or, or a rock or a, 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 a rocket surgeon. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Which sometimes we feel like we're building a rocket as we're as we're trying to fly it here, and when you're, sure. when you're growing a, a big growing business, right? So, yeah. um, you know, just don't take advice from people that haven't been to where you want to be. Got it. Awesome but, stuff. And then, and then, so how did you make that transition into helping the other people achieve similar results? Was it just people were asking you, and and then you decided to formalize it? Yeah. So when I was, when I was able to retire from corporate at age 36 or 37, um, you know, a lot of people saw what I was doing on the side, right. There was, you know, I'd literally do, you know, meetings at my, at my place, at my sixplex or whatever. I had a big apartment there. We'd throw some socials there and whatnot. So people knew what I was doing. And then once I retired with real estate investing, they just started reaching out to me. They're like, Hey, you worked with me at this previous corporate career. And, you know, you were one of the few people that could hold me accountable. Um, I actually want you to hold me accountable to real estate investing. So I said, okay, well, I guess that's proof of concept. So I would just kind of take on a few people a year and help them out. And then it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then I started sharing the journey more on social media. I mean, you can't, you can't keep real estate investing or any business, your dirty secret. Like you gotta let, you gotta let the world know what you're doing. Um, it's, it's interesting. We actually had a speaker on my, um, every Thursday, we, we have a, a teachable event, just similar to like yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And she, she used the analogy of like, it's just like in, in math and high school, you got to show your work. So social media is actually like showing your work of how you, cause if you just have the answer, you're going to think you cheated on, you know, you looked on someone else's test, but if you can actually show your work, then it's proof of concept that you're doing this sort of thing. Love it. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate it, Corey. Uh, so I think Action Taker Deal Maker is a great name for your podcast. So when are you gonna when are you gonna start doing that? Well, we're we're booking guests for September, right? So okay. with your with your help and your encouragement, um, you're leading the way. You're showing what's possible here, and I've probably overthunk it too many times, like some people do with real estate. Exactly. But we just we just set a date and we're launching it, and we're gonna make it happen. So awesome. Looking and forward then, to connecting and staying in touch with people. Yeah. And then how can people, um, first of all, what's your Instagram? Cause I know that you are active there. Yeah, you can, I'm pretty Googleable. I'm pretty searchable on every platform. So just Corey McKinnon, you know, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook. Um, also just look me up on my domain is Corey And that's where they can find out more about the real estate coaching. That's right. Awesome. Well, Corey, uh, fantastic. I mean, I, I love learning about this stuff and, and you really, you really made something that is very complex to a lot of people. You simplified it a lot and it's awesome. Uh, really appreciate those stories because everyone's going to have those. And that was really fantastic. You, is there any final advice you'd like to give to budding real estate investors, uh, people out there going to make their fortune? You know, I, I guess my ultimate goal is to make sure that Craig starts investing in real estate too. Ah, there you go. You know, there you go people hear these horror stories and whatnot, right? So if people can see this, it's a visual, right? So there's, there's always a sine wave. And even if you bought at the peak of a market and there's a pullback, you know, someday that peak is going to be another day's low because over time, real estate goes up and up, you know, it might not be a parabolic, you know, straight line, but yeah. it goes up in these market cycles and it's always going upwards, right? So, you know, time does cure a lot of things when you buy properly if even if you buy terribly, sometimes time can solve all problems. Um, but it's, you know, it's not time in the game, it's time in the game. And, um, you know, get, get started, you don't have to wait as long as I did to get started in real estate. And when you do get started, make sure that you, uh, you're going fast, as fast as you can, because it's a great asset class. Awesome. Love it. All right. So everybody go and look up Corey McKinnon, 
on Instagram and, and uh, on Google, and you will get started on your path to success and a lifetime of wealth building for your family. Thanks, Corey. No problem. Appreciate it, Craig. I told you this was going to be an epic episode, and Corey delivered, all right? He was able to show you the money. So next step, what you want to do is go and search Corey McKinnon. You're going to find his podcast eventually. You're going to find amazing Instagram videos from him and plenty of good stuff, also YouTube videos. And then if you want to be like Corey and get coaching to grow your income so that you can invest in real estate, then go to craigvalentine.com forward slash apply to work with me, grow your business, make the money to invest in real estate like Corey so you have generational wealth, all right? So we got a little link down below. Just click that link and you'll go to the application page as well. And we'll see you on the other side.